The Naples Council on World Affairs is pleased to welcome Barbara Slavin of the Atlantic Council here today. For most of our lives, the Middle East has been a place of turmoil the past few months, weeks, and days, even more so. Last Friday evening, American forces launched a lightning strike in Iraq, killing Major General, General Qasami Soleimani, head of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Overseas Forces. Tonight, our Consul is very fortunate to hear from one of the most knowledgeable and experienced speakers on the region uh, and help us sort this out. Is it our impeccable timing uh, that, is this coincidence or, or not, or uh, does Mimi Gregory is the only one who knows for sure? <laughs> As a career journalist, Barbara Slavin has covered such key foreign policy issues as the U.S.-led war on terrorism, our policy towards rogue states, the Iran-Iraq war, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and, and the uh, Iranian-Palestinian conflict. She has traveled to Iran nine times. Ms. Slavin served as a public policy scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center and as a senior scholar at the U.S. Institute for Peace. Uh, during this time, she wrote a book, which I will mention. The book is called Bitter Friends and Bosom Enemies. Even though it was written 10 years ago, it's, it's very, very relevant to today. She is currently, currently the director of the Future of Iran Institute and a, non, and a, a non-resident scholar, senior scholar at the Atlantic Council. She's also a lecturer on international affairs at George Washington University and a columnist and, uh, at lmonitor.com, a very busy lady. Barbara Slavin. Oh, my Lord, it's just as big a crowd almost <laughs> as this afternoon. I guess something must have happened. Uh, clearly, all Mimi Gregory's fault and uh, otherwise Qasem Soleimani would still be uh, alive and kicking. Listen, I, I want to thank you so much. This is my third time being invited down here, and I've enjoyed every time I've come, but I, I think this is maybe the most important time that I have addressed uh, large audiences because we are truly in a situation where we are hovering between war and peace. And so uh, I hope you will take what I have to say with an understanding that I come at this issue from the experience of covering the Middle East for a very long time, from having traveled to Iran, from knowing and trying to know both sides of the story, and know that there are always more than one side to, to every story. So, over the course of my career, I've covered uh, a lot of history regarding the United States' involvement in the Middle East, and there have been some very high points uh, the Camp David Accords of 1978, the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel, uh, the rapid expulsion of Saddam Hussein's army from Kuwait during the 1991 Gulf War, which was led by the United States and included more than 30 countries, including Arab countries, uh, a true coalition of the willing. Uh, the 1993 Oslo Accords between Israel and the Palestine Liberation Organization. Uh, which had support also from the United States. So there's been a lot of good, both on the diplomatic and the military side. But there have unfortunately been major mistakes. And one of them, to my mind, was the decision in 2003 uh, to invade Iraq, to overthrow Saddam Hussein, on what turned out to be bogus uh, claims that he was developing nuclear and other uh, weapons of mass destruction. Why do I mention 2003? I think it's very, very pertinent to what we're going through now. Because that invasion opened up Iraq to Iranian penetration. Iraq is a country that has a Shia Muslim majority, same as Iran. Many of those people sought refuge in Iran during the Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s. They were groomed by Iran, they were trained by Iran. They came in, as the U.S. did, and overthrew Saddam, established themselves there. More militias were created. Many of them became very powerful in the politics of that country. Um, as a result, it's been impossible to push Iran out of Iraq. And the Trump administration 
when it made a decision to get out of the Iran nuclear deal, the other fateful decision in 2018, reimposing sanctions, tried to force Iraq to choose between the United States, 6,000 miles away, and its neighbor, very powerful neighbor. It was an impossible decision. What happened over the, the Christmas, New Year's break, when all of us were trying to get a little bit of rest from, from the news? What happened was this. Uh, rockets were fired on an American installation in the city of Kirkuk. An American contractor was killed. As a result, President Trump ordered reprisal strikes on an Iraqi militia, which had carried out this, these attacks, killed 25 Iraqis. Iraqis retaliated. They tried to storm our embassy in Baghdad. Then the President of the United States made the decision, even though the, the siege of the embassy was ended, no loss of life, Iraqi soldiers came in and pushed the, these groups away, the President decided to assassinate the most senior national security official of Iran. I wrote a, an op-ed in the New York Times a couple of days ago, um, which I think has been put on, on, on your website, and I'm going to do something that I don't normally do, but I'm going to just quote the first two paragraphs of that op-ed. I wrote, Few tears will be shed in many parts of the world for Major General Qasem Soleimani, whose Quds Force of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard ruthlessly spread Iranian influence, and contributed to the deaths of thousands of Syrians, Iraqis, Iranians, as well as hundreds of American servicemen in Iraq over the past decade and a half. But revenge is not a strategy, and the killing of General Soleimani is a major and incredibly risky escalation with Iran, a pivotal country of 80 million people that has been largely estranged from the United States for 40 years. This decision will cause more instability and the loss of more innocent lives. Chances for American diplomacy with Iran are dead for the duration of the Trump presidency, if not longer. Instead of one nuclear proliferation crisis with North Korea, there will now be two, as the 2015 Iran nuclear deal completely collapses. The Sunni fundamentalists who killed Americans in our homeland something Iran has not done so far, will rejoice. Russia and China will be happy to see the United States mired in the Middle East for the foreseeable future. That's the, you know, that's the elevator speech. That's the capsulated version of what the consequences will be. And I wrote that several days ago, and what have we seen since then? We have seen the Iraqi parliament vote to expel the 5,000 American troops who remain in that country. And although the vote was non-binding, the U.S. military presence there is clearly untenable after assassinating not just Qasem Soleimani, but Iraqis on Iraqi soil. I think, you know, the Pentagon, there are various reports now that the Pentagon is reconfiguring our troops for the, their possible removal, evacuation from the country. The mission for which they were sent, which was fighting the Islamic State group, has been suspended, and those troops are now focused entirely on protecting themselves. Elsewhere in the Middle East, embassies are being reinforced. Trump has sent an extra 3,000 troops, on top of 14,000 sent earlier this year, to protect U.S. facilities. Americans in Iraq, business people, others have been told to leave. Uh, the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, who is a great cheerleader for this maximum pressure policy, went on the talk shows on Sunday and said, America is safer, Americans are safer as a result. You be the judge. So how, how did this escalatory spiral begin? Well, I began with the, the sort of original sin of the Iraq invasion, which opened, opened Iraq to Iran, opened the so-called Shia crescent, whereby Iran could spread its influence not just through Iraq, but into Syria and, and Lebanon. We have that. But more immediately, we have the decision of May 2018, when President Trump announced that he was going to leave the so-called Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. Even though, at the time, Iran was in full compliance with this agreement. 
A year after this decision was announced, the, the U.S., Mike Pompeo again, said that Iran would not be allowed to export any oil, not a single drop of oil. And this is a country that relies on oil revenues, not just to support Qasem Soleimani and his Quds Force and various militias in the region, but to feed its people. This is the so-called maximum pressure campaign. Why was it imposed? Well, one of the reasons that was given by the Trump administration was that it was going to force Iran to come back to the table to negotiate a better deal. It was going to force Iran to, quote-unquote, behave like a normal nation, whatever that may be. What has happened? Iran has become more provocative, more aggressive, both in the region and in terms of its own people, and diplomacy is much more difficult. Let's go back and talk about this so-called JCPOA just for a minute. It, it was not a perfect deal. It had many flaws. No arms control agreement with an adversary is ever perfect. It has to be a compromise, or else you can't, you can't reach it. If you go back to the period when this deal was being negotiated, you'll remember that Iran was rapidly enriching uranium to higher and higher levels. There was tremendous panic in the world that Iran would be able to create a nuclear weapon. Um, Israel was threatening to bomb Iran, with or without U.S. support, and this issue was at the very top of the list for uh, the world's foreign policy establishment. The Obama administration took a number of steps to deal with it. They imposed very tough sanctions, but they did it with international support, not unilaterally. Europeans agreed to stop buying Iranian oil, the United Nations Security Council passed resolutions forbidding various kinds of trade with Iran, and Russia and China not only abided by those resolutions, but scaled back other trade with Iran. There was covert work as well. The Israelis and the Americans worked together to inject a computer virus into Iran's nuclear program, something called Stuxnet, which set back the program by a couple of years. But these these tough measures were combined with diplomacy. Iran, uh, Obama made very clear from his campaign and his inaugural address that he would reach out his hand if Iran would unclench its fist, that he wanted negotiations with his country, a country of 80 million people, pivotal in the Middle East. And back-channel talks began uh, in 2012 with Iran in the, in the country of Oman, small Arab country. These talks eventually led to the JCPOA. Um, in return, the United States and other countries were supposed to relieve sanctions on Iran. That was the deal. Allow Iran to export its oil freely. U.S. was even going to sell Iran Boeings, which may have been a mixed blessing, all things considered. <laughs> but there would even be some limited U.S. trade. And, and business people were going to Iran, Europeans were going, lots of tourists were going, some members of your own organization took trips to Iran, had a fabulous time. There was hope in the country that Iran's long isolation from the international community would, would finally, uh, finally end. The deal, as I said, was not perfect, but Iran promised that it would not be able to produce enough material for a single nuclear weapon for 15 years until the year 2030. What happened yesterday? Iran announced that it would resume all of its nuclear activities, all of them that had been prohibited by the JCPOA. This is something that we had been expecting, frankly, even before the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, but I'm sure that that was a further encouragement to them to resume their program. Um, so a crisis that might not have awaited us until the year 2030 is now on our doorstep today. One thing Iran didn't do, though, and I'm very thankful for this, they said that they would allow the International Atomic Energy Agency to keep inspectors in the country. They inspect 17 Iranian nuclear facilities 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So the world will be able to see exactly what Iran is doing, to what level they enrich uranium, how many centrifuges they install, what their stockpiles are of material. And that will at least not leave us in the situation we were in with North Korea in 2002 when the Bush administration pulled out of a deal with North Korea called the Agreed Framework, when North Korea kicked out inspectors 
and quit the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and began to race toward nuclear weapons and now has maybe several dozen nuclear weapons. So Iran has not chosen to go that far. But there are people in Tehran who are talking about it because they say to themselves, well, if you have nuclear weapons, the United States does not attack you. The United States does not assassinate your senior general. They have a point. They have a point. Um, now, the nuclear deal, as you may remember, had a lot of powerful opponents at the time. Uh, in particular, the Israeli government of Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu and Iran's chief Arab rivals, the Saudis and the Emiratis. And they lobbied very hard against it. They spent millions of dollars on the campaign. Uh, it was very partisan. No Republicans voted in favor of it. But be because of the way the review process was structured, you needed a two-thirds majority in both the House and the Senate to block the JCPOA. And uh, the opponents of the deal were not able to achieve that. So it survived the congressional review. In 2016, it went into full implementation. Nine months later, Donald Trump was elected and the promise of the JCPOA began to fade. Donald Trump said in the campaign it was the worst deal ever negotiated. He said he could replace it with something much better. He stuck with it for a while, persuaded by his top advisors, initially Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and Defense Secretary Jim Mattis. But in 2018, he fired them and he got advisors who supported his a uh, much more hawkish uh, point of view. Mike Pompeo, in his very first speech as Secretary of State, gave a, a, a kind of outline of what he expected of Iran. He said Iran had to behave like a so-called normal nation, and he listed 12 demands for changes, radical changes in Iranian foreign policy that would call for it to have no nuclear program whatsoever, uh, to withdraw from all the countries in the Middle East where it had influence and had uh, supporters, um, stop testing ballistic missiles, a whole list of things that would essentially amount to Iran not being Iran anymore because these were policies that would had long been identified with this country. Um, and then, as I mentioned, of course, the, the sanctions got ramped up. Initially, there were waivers for a half dozen countries to import a little bit of Iranian oil. Those were eliminated last May uh, when the maximum pressure campaign was ratcheted up. More sanctions were added on various Iranian institutions, individuals. Even the foreign minister of Iran was, was sanctioned uh, as a, a supporter of terrorism. Um, so what has happened since then? You know, Iran for a year had a policy of what it called strategic patience. It stayed within the deal. It didn't do anything particularly out of the ordinary for Iran. But after this oil embargo was imposed, essentially a, de a declaration of economic war against the country, all of a sudden, tankers in the Persian Gulf started being attacked with mines. In September, there were precision strikes on Saudi Arabia's largest oil facility that put offline a half of Saudi Arabia's oil uh, production for a while. Um, rockets started being lobbed into the green zone in Iraq, where the US Embassy is, and into various other locations around Iraq where Americans are based. And finally, as we saw the other week, one of them killed an American contractor, which triggered this, this whole cycle. So maximum pressure has not resulted in any improvement in Iran's policies or behavior, it's been the reverse. Everything has gotten worse. Internally, the most hardline forces in the country, the ones that never trusted the United States, that objected to the Iran nuclear deal as being a sellout, because Iran put all sorts of restrictions on its program, these people have been strengthened. And in December, sorry, in November, uh, Iran raised the price of gasoline abruptly, reduced subsidies, because of the pressures on its economy caused by American sanctions. There were protests throughout the country. They were brutally suppressed. Hundreds of people were killed. Thousands were arrested. After what has happened now, the so-called opposition in Iran dares not show its head. And if you turned on your televisions any time today 
and watch the news, I'm sure you saw the crowds in Tehran and other cities at the funeral for Qasem Soleimani. A million people in the streets of Tehran in support of their government chanting death to America. If that is the result of maximum pressure, if that's supposed to be winning, I don't know what losing looks like. Mind you, this is a country that's predisposed to like the United States, or at least used to be. Why did they come out in support of Qasem Soleimani, even though this is a man who clearly has blood on his hands? Well, he did his work outside Iran. He, his Quds Force is the external arm of the security forces, kind of like our special forces and our CIA put together. The people he killed were Sunni, Sunnis primarily, Sunni extremists, people in ISIS, Al-Qaeda, unfortunately a lot of ordinary people in Syria as well, many of them Sunni Muslims. He worked with all these various groups, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas, various militias in Iraq, the Assad regime. These were his partners. The argument to the Iranian people was that he was keeping them safe from attack. These, these proxies would deter an attack on the Iranian homeland and that he was countering ISIS. And there were times when his Quds force was actually working in parallel with the United States and not just against ISIS, but if you go back to 9-11, after 9-11, it was the Quds force that helped the United States indirectly overthrow the Taliban in Afghanistan and put a new government in place there. Why did the Quds Force become our enemy? How did Qasem Soleimani become our enemy? In 2003, when the United States invaded Iraq, John Bolton, you remember him? He said Iran should take a number, implying that Iran would be the next country to be invaded and to have its regime overthrown. The US did not work with Iran, it worked against Iran. It gave protection to a group called the Mujahideen Hulk, the MEK, which had been an ally of Saddam Hussein against Iran during the Iran-Iraq War. The US promised Iran it would trade the leaders of the, this group for Al-Qaeda detainees in Iran. Instead, it gave protection to the MEK. Many of those people are now in Albania, where they run a troll farm that, among other things, torments people like me on Twitter. Not a very nice group. John Bolton, by the way, is on their payroll. He's taken a half million dollars from them. So has Rudy Giuliani. I wonder why he's such a hawk on the issue of Iran. As I mentioned, the Iraqi parliament has now voted to expel the 5,000 U.S. troops in the country because the U.S. has violated the status of forces agreement that we have with Iraq, which says that we will not use Iraq as a venue for settling scores with other countries. If the U.S. leaves, which really appears inevitable now, this is only going to reinforce Iranian influence over Iraq. And I feel very sorry for my Iraqi friends who don't want to be under anyone's domination. They want a sovereign state, like any normal people. Um, but we've put them in an impossible position. And, of course, among the other losers, big losers, are the Iranian people. You know, the... The Trump administration claims to care about them and talks about supporting Iranian voices. Well, under maximum pressure, the Iranian economy has contracted by 10%. The Iranian currency is worth less than a third of what it was when Trump took office. Unemployment, particularly among young people, is on the rise. And I mentioned the demonstrations that took place, uh, prompted by economic grievances primarily, but also with a political overtone that were brutally suppressed uh, just the other month. We have to condemn Iran for the crimes it has committed against its own people and against others. Um, but maximum pressure has not made the situation better. It has made the situation worse. Uh, many in the Iranian regime believe that the, the true U.S. goal is regime change, the overthrow of the Iranian government. And if you think your regime's survival is at stake, you're not going to compromise. You're going to hang tough. That's what we would do. I mean, you don't need any special understanding of oriental psychology to understand that when you declare economic war on a people, they're going to fight back, and most likely they are going to rally uh, around the flag. Uh, Qasem Soleimani is a martyr now. The other thing the Trump administration doesn't get is the role of martyrdom in the Shia religion. Their most revered figures were killed by unjust 
powers. And now Qasem Soleimani has gone to heaven and joined the ranks of the martyrs. You will see his picture plastered everywhere. The people who came out to mourn him included people who don't like the regime. But they had an extra incentive to come out because just the other day, and he repeated it, Donald Trump said that if Iran retaliates for the assassination of Soleimani, he has 52 targets in mind, and they include cultural sites. Iran is a country thousands of years old. It has precious archaeological sites. It has places like Persepolis, unmatched, more than two dozen sites that are on the UNESCO uh, list of, of you know, world treasures. Can you imagine if a foreign government killed our senior security figure and then threatened to, to bomb the Washington Monument or, or, you know, I mean, we don't have anything equivalent, frankly, to what, uh, to what Iran has in terms of uh, cultural heritage. So I think one of the reasons that the crowds came out uh, was because of this threat, and there, there are tweets now showing uh, Trump dressed as a member of ISIS with a long beard, uh, destroying uh, artifacts in Iran. People have been tweeting pictures from Persepolis, Isfahan, uh, other places that have uh, priceless archaeological uh, relics. So nationalism now has, has grown, and, uh, and, and this is, again, another result of the decision to not only have maximum pressure, but then to assassinate Soleimani. Um, I should also mention that by leaving the Iran nuclear deal and all the other policies that have been taken regarding Iran, the U.S. has uh, widened the split that we have with our closest allies in Europe. Um, Europeans are very, very upset that the U.S. left the Iran nuclear deal. They've been trying to somehow keep it together, not very successfully. Uh, U.S. dominance of the financial system because of the role of the dollar means that European companies that had signed agreements with Iran have pulled out because they don't want to jeopardize their much more important business in the United States. And Iran is even having trouble buying food and medicine because no banks will handle the transaction, even though food and medicine is not supposed to be uh, sanctioned. Um, you will note the uh, lack of enthusiasm for the Soleimani killing in the statements that have come out from Europeans over the last couple of days. Uh, they are very worried, very upset. And I think the European Union has even called a special meeting to try to talk about whether there are ways to, to de-escalate. Um, who are the winners? I mentioned ISIS, Al-Qaeda. There's been some suggestion in the circles that I travel in that they may even conduct attacks on Americans and then try to blame it on Iran, so-called false flag operations. I wouldn't put it past them. Other winners, China, Russia. Their influence in the Middle East, already growing, will grow more and more and more. They are seen as the honest broker now in the region. Vladimir Putin can go to any country he wants in the Middle East, Israel, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and be, be welcomed as a serious figure. What does that say about our own influence with these countries? Another mention of, of sanctions and how sanctions work. This has become the tool of choice for the Trump administration. When in doubt, sanction. And Trump threatened, he said, if the Iraqis kick out the Americans, he's going to sanction them. Remember, this is a country we've spent over a trillion dollars and 5,000 American lives to liberate and he's saying, if they kick out the Americans without our agreement, he's going to sanction them. Sanctions only work when they are truly multilateral, not shoved down other countries' throats, and when they have a clear and attainable goal. That's when they work. That's how we got to the JCPOA. The goal was a negotiation on Iran's nuclear program. That was what ensued. It was endorsed by the international community. Can anyone in this audience tell me what is the goal of U.S. sanctions? What is the goal of the maximum pressure campaign on Iran? Do you really know what the goal is? It depends, you know, on who's talking. I mean, is it Mike Pompeo's 12 demands? Is it just a, a new deal with Iran? Is it a photo op between President Trump and the president of Iran, Hassan Rouhani? We don't know. There's a, there's a quote 
from a, a friend of mine, a former U.S. hostage in Iran, by the way, John Limbert. He quotes this from Alice in Wonderland. The quote goes like this, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. <laughs> any road will take you there. Last thing I read on my, my Twitter feed before coming in tonight is that the U.S. has sent B-52 bombers to Diego Garcia to be ready to bomb Iran. This is a president who said he was going to end the endless wars in the Middle East. Congress is going to have some discussions about this, but, you know, can, can anyone stop Donald Trump if he's deciding to do this? We are in a really uncomfortable position where we are counting on the restraint and maturity of the Islamic Republic of Iran not to do anything more to provoke Donald Trump. And I think that is a really terrible position to be in. So with that cheery entree, I would be very happy to take your questions. We have mics in the aisles on I'm your terrified. left and on your right. Um, we'll start question over here. Um, I think the, um, the Saudis are sworn enemies of Iran. How do you see them coming or not coming into this situation? Yeah, it's a really interesting question, you know. The Saudis were very gung-ho for the United States to leave the nuclear deal and to impose sanctions on Iran, and the Saudis have picked up a lot of uh, oil sales as a result from, you know, old clients of Iran that now need uh, oil from another source. But after the attacks on their uh, oil installations, they got very scared. And they've actually been reaching out to Iran uh, indirectly over the last couple of months to try to de-escalate the situation because they, they can't afford to suffer any more attacks like that. There is a report that the Prime Minister of Iraq, uh, Adil Abdel Mahdi, uh, was waiting for Qasem Soleimani to come to Baghdad to present Iran's answer to an offer from the Saudis for a de-escalation of tensions. And if this report is true, the United States obviously interrupted <laughs> that particular uh, peace process by killing Soleimani. Next question over here, please. Yes, I'm a retired naval officer. Um, I'm wondering if someone tells me to put the target into my missile guidance that will strike a world cultural center, which is then a war crime. Yes. Will there be a tribunal you know, which will try me for war crimes? And how does any military officer deal with that order? It's a very good question. By the way, the chief of staff of the Pentagon quit today. Coincidental? I, I didn't hear that. The chief of staff of the Pentagon quit today. So did our ambassador in Afghanistan, has left Afghanistan which is another place, by the way, where retaliation against Americans could, could take place. We have 15,000 troops there still? Yeah. Yes, I find this timing curious. Do you think it has anything to do with deflecting attention from the impeachment process? <laughs> <laughs> Seems I have a lot of Democrats here. Um, well, you know, there is this, this wag the dog uh, scenario. Um, we saw it when, when Bill Clinton was impeached. Uh, no, you know, I, I think Trump did it because I think he freaked out when our embassy, uh, when people started to attack our embassy. I think he was terrified that they would get in, that they would hold Americans hostage, and that it would be like 1979 all over again, and that Trump would be like Jimmy Carter. That's, that's really what I think happened, more than, than wag the dog. Uh, Netanyahu was a very person who was very much against the joint agreement. 
How do they view what's going on now? I'm so glad you asked, because this is, again, just from today. Netanyahu's statement to his security cabinet, quote, the assassination of Soleimani isn't an Israeli event, but an American event. We were not involved and should not be dragged into it. <laughs> Draw your own conclusions. Yeah. Next question, please. Yeah, um, I, I know at the time they were, when they were talking about the JCPOA, an, another alternative that was put forward as opposed to <clears throat> leaving it was to basically negotiate another deal, not leave it, but negotiate another deal mm -hmm. with our partners in the agreement mm -hmm. um, that would you know, address it, issues like being a bad actor and that kind of stuff. Would, what would have the quid pro quo have been, and is that realistic that that mm -hmm. could have been done and mm -hmm. should, should have been attempted? Yeah, you know, there was a, a, an effort that was made, uh, but it was very odd because we were negotiating with the Europeans, not with Iran, over this, as though the Europeans could get the Iranians to, to change their activities. Um, there was something called the Joint Commission. It still exists. It was set up to meet every three months to discuss implementation of the JCPOA. Uh, fairly senior level uh, diplomats, you know, deputy secretaries of state, that kind of level, would attend. And it was a venue where the U.S. could raise any issue with Iran that it wanted to. So if the U.S. had wanted to open a negotiation on Yemen or Syria or Iraqi militias, it could, could have raised those issues there. By quitting the agreement, the U.S. lost its ability to have that kind of con uh, consultation. And it seems that, that this administration is afraid of talking to Iranians. Uh, they just denied permission for the foreign minister of Iran to come to the United Nations this week, which is a violation of our agreement under, uh, under our, the UN uh, rules, by the way, our host agreement with the United Nations. So I don't understand what that effort was about. You know, the Europeans have tried very hard. Uh, Emmanuel Macron had a plan, which he pushed with Trump, for a credit for Iran, a $15 billion credit for future oil sales, uh, in return for which Iran would come back into compliance with the nuclear deal. But uh, Trump didn't agree to it. And he has rebuffed other efforts by people like the Prime Minister of Japan, other, other would-be mediators who've, who've, who've tried to, to see some way out. I mean, it's this maximum pressure, you know, this refusal to offer anything to Iran to make it worth their while to even enter negotiations. That has, I think, really been uh, at fault here. Next question over here. Yes. Uh, Newsweek just reported that Netanyahu is trying to put again uh, together a coalition of Arab countries to attack Iran. <laughs> that was reported today. Uh, good luck. I'm saying, what are your thoughts on that? In, oh, it's in insane. First this. of all, Arab countries are not going to fight with Israel right. against a Muslim country. Who wrote this? It was in Newsweek. Yeah, but who? Who was the I author? I don't know. I just glanced at the article. All right. Well, uh, I'm sh I, you, know, you know, bully to him, but it's not going to happen. Okay. <laughs> he can't even get Arab, Arab governments to openly recognize right. him right. or accept the plan of the century you know, a peace agreement with the Palestinians. So, no, that's not going to happen. Back over here for the next question, please. Yes, uh, there, there's been speculation that if the United States, or when the United States leaves Iraq fairly abruptly, that uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda may arise. Is the population of Iraq, or would the population of Iraq become united enough to stand up to them on their own? I don't think they have the capacity. I mean, what will happen is they will have to invite more Iranians in to fight for them. Mm -hmm. Because the Iranians are the only ones who will fight for them, which means the country will become really a, a satellite of, of Iran in many ways. And, and this is not something that the Iraqi people want. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a true tragedy for them. Are, and they've the, seen many. Are the Turks and the Russians um, 
offering any po or would they have any possible role as mercenaries or helpful friends? Uh, the Turks are going into Syria. Well, the Turks are, are more interested in fighting Libya. Kurds, and they've just sent uh, troops to Libya. Libya, yeah. So, no, I don't think they would. Uh, Russia, I don't think so either. I think they are pretty busy also in Syria, and they're also in Libya, mm -hmm. where they have mercenaries in, in something called the Wagner Group, who have been fighting in support of a, of a strong man named General Hifter mm -hmm. against the uh, recognized government of, of, of Libya. So, no, I think, I mean, the Iranians will come in. They have militias already who fought ISIS the first time around. And they will ramp them up, and they will do their best. But you know, the the country will become uh, another failed state in the Middle East, uh, and uh, instability will go on and on and on. Next question over yeah. here. Please. We we we're here at this point without pointing blame at President Trump or President this or President that. We're at the point right now where Iran is now going to pursue nuclear weapons. They're probably very close. What do you think is happening in the capitals of Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Israel, yeah. Jordan? Yeah. At this point, you know, you said before you don't think the, the, that, that Israel and that uh, Saudi Arabia would, or would get together militarily, but they are in contact with each other. Yeah. So I well, don't think first you're Newsweek, making. I don't think that Newsweek story is so far off. You're making an assumption that that is not yet the case. Um, you know, if that does transpire, I would think that there would be a real possibility of military action against Iran's nuclear facilities. I think it would be the Israelis and the United States. Though the Arab countries don't have that capacity. Maybe the Emirates. They have some good pilots. Not the Saudis. The Saudis are hopeless. I hope there are no Saudis in the audience, but if you look at what they've done in Yemen over the last yeah. however many years, it's not a pretty picture. Um, the Iranians will be calibrated, I think, in this uh, slow return to their previous nuclear status. They, they never enrich uranium beyond 20% U-235, and you need 80% to make a bomb. So as long as they stay below that threshold, Probably uh, this, this won't happen. Of course, Iran can destroy Saudi Arabia's oil installations completely, and the Saudis know that. Uh, they can destroy the city of Dubai, and the Emirate, Emiratis know that. That's why I think this idea of some sort of joint uh, effort is, is far-fetched, and that we're more likely to see efforts to tone this down so that well, the whole region does right, not destroy right, itself. Right now, Israel is running sorties in Syria, bombing Iraqi sites where they have missiles and... No, the it's Israelis not, it's not are... In, it's not in the Israelis newspaper. are bombing sites in both Syria and Iraq. They're not using Saudis to do that. They have No, the no, they're doing capacity. it themselves. Yes, they do, the Israelis right. are nobody, doing it themselves. Nobody's saying boo. From, there's no boo from Saudi Arabia. No. No boo no, from no, Egypt. No, no, no. boo from any place. No, no. They, the Egyptians won't either. They won't do that. Okay. Next, over here, please. There's been a lot of discussion of the War Powers Act and co-equal branches of government. What role do you expect Congress to play in the mess that you've described, and particularly the Senate Foreign Relations Committee? Yeah. Well, the House is going to, to discuss it and vote, but the real question is whether there are enough uh, Republicans in the Senate who might actually take a stand on this. And I, I'm not a congressional correspondent, so... I've not, you know, and Congress is just coming back this week, so I haven't been able to take their temperature. I know that Senator Rand Paul is opposed to this, but I don't know if anyone else among the Republicans is at this point. Next question, please. Since you've had broad experience in the Middle East, one of the puzzling questions is that, aside from the current Trump administration blunders, there has been a consistent Republican or Democratic administrations taking the policy, the strategy that Iran is the enemy, back from mm -hmm. yeah. George W. Bush that put them on the axis of evil, and continue to plant, put our alliance strictly in the Sunni camp, if you will. Yeah. And the Sunni camp is the one that feeds the Salafist ideology that produces right. ISIS, that cost us 
a lot of headaches and, and threatens our national security. So who are the voices? I mean, in 2003, there were voices in Washington that convinced George W. Bush to steer away from Afghanistan and invade Iraq. Today, there must be voices that are saying, continue to put the maximum pressure, pressure on Iran. The strategy doesn't make sense, yeah. uh, notwithstanding the blunders of the Trump administration. Yeah. So who are the what's people? your take on it? Well, Mike Pence and Mike Pompeo have been the two most prominent still in the administration. John Bolton, cheerleading from, from the outside. Um, there are people who uh, believe that, that the Islamic Republic needs to be destroyed and are prepared to take the United States to war to do it. Let's say we lived in a fantasy world and all of a sudden the Trump administration hired you as their expert on Iran. Okay. What? <laughs> now that you're in this fantasy world, Mm -hmm. What would be your main three or four suggestions to the Trump administration going forward? I'll take sit down. Okay. Well, I would tell Donald Trump to stop tweeting about destroying Iran's cultural heritage. That, that would be a good start. Um, I would say that the United States should offer some incentives to Iran to come back into compliance with the nuclear deal. Uh, the policy of maximum pressure, of sanctions, 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 uh, is not working, it has backfired. It has caused Iran to become more aggressive, more provocative, and is, has led us to, to where we are today. So, you know, there was a deal, actually, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, had an idea that Iran be given a $15 billion credit for future oil sales, and that it could be used for Iran to buy um, food and medicine from European companies. Food and medicine are not supposed to be sanctioned. Uh, in return, uh, Iran would come back into compliance with the nuclear deal. President Trump listened to this idea, but he didn't agree to it. If he'd agreed to that back in September, um, we wouldn't be in the position we're in today. So I would say, take that idea or, or some other incentives, offer negotiations in good faith, offer incentives, uh, understand that maximum pressure has not worked. Next question over here, please. Uh, this morning's Asia Times had something very distressing. I want two sentences. I want to read it to you and ask you, is this at all possible? So Major General Qasem Soleimani had flown into Baghdad on a normal carrier flight carrying a diplomatic passport. He had been sent by Tehran to deliver in person a reply to a message from Riyadh on de-escalation across the Middle East. Those negotiations had been requested by the Trump administration. Yeah, um, the, the prime minister of Iraq, the caretaker prime minister, Adil Abdel Mahdi, said this yesterday, that the reason Qasem Soleimani was there was to give Iran's reply to an offer from Saudi Arabia to de-escalate tensions. That's what he said, in which case this assassination was even more insane. Um, Soleimani, you know, there have been multiple opportunities to, to assassinate him over the years. He was traveling openly. You know, this wasn't Osama bin Laden hiding out somewhere or Baghdadi hiding in a cave somewhere. This was the authorized representative of a sovereign government. Yes, he has American blood on his hands. Estimates are some 600 American troops died in Iraq at the hands of... Iraqi militias supported by Iran. But as I mentioned, I mean, that was a response to the American invasion of Iraq. I Iran has not killed so far any Americans on US soil, unlike Osama bin Laden, unlike ISIS supporters. So if this account is true, it is truly a tragedy because we could have been on a path to de-escalation of tensions instead of the reverse. Question over here, please. I'm fascinated with the focus on, uh, almost entirely on actions that Trump has taken and taken us down this road. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we have some things going on in the Senate. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> what would do you think uh, or how would all of this be affected hmm. if the senators, if the Republican senators 
decided to actually have a good trial mm -hmm. and then were influenced and removed Trump from the presidency. Uh, what what uh, effect would it have? Or uh, yeah, uh, look, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> so I, I, you know, it's it's. We're doing it's, everything we can for it to. I, I don't think it's going to happen. It's it, huh? it's too much of a hypothetical. Um, look, I hope that you know President Trump. Look, he's very erratic and unpredictable. He can change his mind, and you know maybe when he's seen the million people on the streets of Tehran chanting "Death to America," maybe he'll think twice about continuing to pursue this particular path. Um, he, there are people even on his favorite television channel who've told him this, is, this was a mistake. Uh, you know, so it's possible that he will listen to reason. I hope so. Next question, please. I have a hard time understanding what um, war with the Iran would even look like. Oh. Do you have any idea like what a strategy would be? How would we know if we won, or, uh, <laughs> or Nobody. might might we expect uh, oh. a retaliation here? Or yeah. uh, I, I just I, I can't I can't imagine it. Do you have any idea? If the United States starts bombing Iran, you know for sure we will see retaliation in this country, which is something we've not seen from Iran. I mean the only the only case that people cite is that there was a plot that was disrupted. To, to kill the Saudi ambassador to Washington in a restaurant called Cafe Milano. I don't know how many of you have been to it in Washington. It's a very nice Italian restaurant, I have to say. This was a plot that was concocted by the brother-in-law of someone in the Revolutionary Guard who was a used car salesman in El Paso, Texas. It was quickly discovered by the... Um, the, oops, sorry, somebody's calling me. No, I will not talk to you now. Um, <laughs> it was quickly disrupted by the um, Drug Enforcement Agency because this, uh, this brother-in-law, used car salesman, was going to use uh, the, some Mexican drug cartel to carry out the hit. The whole thing was preposterous. It was, it was never going to happen. But that's the only case of quote-unquote terrorism that can be attributed to Iran, you know, in this country. So if we were to start bombing Iran, you know, uh, especially cultural sites, I wouldn't want to visit the Washington Monument that day. No, it's too horrific to even imagine. And, and even in my worst nightmares, uh, I, I don't think we're going to get to that. I think the, 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 the fighting will take place mostly in the Middle East, and uh, it will, will involve, unfortunately, American service personnel. You know, we, we've just sent another 3,000 to the region. It's, it's just, you know, this is a guy who promised to end endless wars, not to start more of them. Thank you. Uh, last question, please. I um, was also trying to think out where we are the most vulnerable to attack from a military point of view. And what I came up with was our 500 or 1,000 troops in, in Syria, which are surrounded by many oh, yeah. of the yeah. enemies. And I, was the, I think that probably is one of our most vulnerable. And I was also thinking, would Iran do it or would they use their proxies yeah. in the next escalation step? Yeah. Well, you know, I don't think those troops are going to be able to remain there. I don't think the 5,000 Americans in Iraq are going to be able to remain there. Um, it, you know, it's so sad, too, because Iraq finally had a government that, a government of technocrats, the people that are in power now, people who speak English, educated in the U.S. Um, some of our big companies were going over there to help develop their oil and gas, uh, help them develop their electrical grid, all this stuff. All of these people have been evacuated now. Americans can't be in Iraq now. It's too dangerous for them. So, you know, the, all this blood and treasure, 5,000 American dead, over, over a trillion dollars spent just to, to hand Iraq over to Iran. It's, it's, it's just tragic. And uh, we could, you know, the Trump administration kept trying to force Iraq to choose between the United States and Iran. And in that position, Iraq has to choose Iran. It has a 1,400-kilometer border with Iran. 
It can't choose the United States, especially when we have a president who, who you know, one day says we have troops and the next day says we're withdrawing and can't seem to make up his mind whether he wants to be in or out of the Middle East. Thank you, Barbara. You're welcome.